Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I got a short little lecture for you today on macromolecules. Give you some general information about what they are, how they're made, how they're broken down. And we're going to dive into one of them in particular today that you've already heard of carbohydrates. So please make sure that you've gone to Canvas, you've downloaded this carbohydrate note guide. Fill this out as we go through this lecture. You can turn this in for points towards your grade, and you can also use this on your quiz. So hey, there's benefits all around to having this done. So let's go ahead and get started. We have some general information to cover on macromolecules, and there are six elements that make up most macromolecules, and they're listed here. Carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. You can see the relative sizes of each one of these atoms here. Um, but if we take the first letter or the atomic symbol of each element and we put it in this order, you have this made up word chinops. And if you can remember chinops, then you can remember the six elements needed for life. Now, when it comes to putting these six elements in a body, they're not all used equally. So here we have a little pie chart showing you which elements are used in the human body and roughly about how much of your body is made of each of these six elements. So if you're looking at this pie chart, which element makes up most of you? Well, hopefully you're thinking, well, that big yellow area is oxygen, so that must be it. That would be correct and might be surprising because we typically think of oxygen as being a gas. But oxygen, keep in mind, can bond with other um, atoms to give you solid things that you can use to make up a life form. Now, if we look at these elements, you're also going to notice that there's a lot of carbon, there's a lot of hydrogen, but there's very little of our other um, other three elements that, that we use in life forms. So where do you get this material to build your body? It comes from what you eat. You literally are what you eat. So nutrition is very important. We have two types of nutrients, macronutrients, which are things you need a lot of, carbohydrates, proteins, and lipids. When you think of lipids as fat. And then we have micronutrients. And these are things you don't need as many of, like your vitamins and your minerals. So think about your bones. What element do you need to make strong bones, ladies and gentlemen? Hopefully you're thinking calcium, right? But you don't need just a ton of calcium in your diet, although it is very important to have some. Now, when we looked at our nutrition labels, or if you've ever investigated those on your own, then you've seen calories listed and maybe wondered, well, I don't know exactly what a calorie is. But a calorie is just simply a unit of energy. And one calorie is the amount of energy needed to heat one gram or milliliter of water by one degree Celsius. It's a very small unit of energy. And when you look at food calories on a nutrition label, those are actually measured as kilocalories. So that would be a thousand of these little calories. And we, we measure them that way to keep the number a little lower since we do need so many calories. Now, you may have heard before that you need 2,000 calories a day to stay healthy, but that really depends on who you are. It depends on your age, it depends on your activity level, and even your gender. So I've given you a little diagram here to help you make some good decisions about how many calories that you need. Keep in mind that if you do not burn all of the calories that you, use, that you get in a day, you're going to gain weight. And if you burn more calories than you're going to take in in a day, then you're going to lose weight. So where these calories come from is incredibly important for your health. So you can't just get them from anywhere. It's important to have these macromolecules um, around and readily available to get energy. They're all broken down in different ways and in different speeds. So very important to get your calories from the right sources. As an adult, you would want about 45 to 65% of your calories coming from carbohydrates, about 20 to 25% coming from your fats, and about 10 to 35% coming from your proteins. And again, that's going to have a lot to do with your activity level. Kids are going to need more fat in their diet, so they want calories about 25 to 40% of their calories coming from fat. Uh, but no matter your age, you want to restrict the amount of calories you're getting from added sugars like table sugar to less than 25% of your daily intake of calories. All right, so the most important uh, element out of our six is going to be carbon. Can you remember the other five? Think chinops, right? So you would have hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur. But the most important is going to be this carbon, and the reason for that is its atomic structure. If we look here, you can see that carbon has six electrons, as represented by these little dots, and there's only four electrons in this outer shell. 
but it can hold eight. Maybe you remember that from physical science. So that gives carbon the opportunity to bond with other elements in any direction on this atom. So it can make all kinds of shapes and the different atoms that it's going to use can have all kinds of functions. So it's an incredibly important molecule for life just based on the fact that you can get all these different kinds of shapes from it. It forms very strong covalent bonds. So they're hard to break apart, which is good. You wouldn't want your body to just fall apart on you. And it usually is going to bond with other carbons, nitrogen, oxygens, or hydrogens. But of course, it can bond with other atoms as well. Now, when we're talking about macromolecules, there's four that we need to know, and they're listed here. We're going to go over carbohydrates today, but they all have these things called monomers or little units that are going to make them up. So these are big molecules, and these are the little molecules that build these big molecules. So monomer, mono means one, and mer means part. Think mermaid, part man, part fish, right? So um, monomer is a small group of atoms that's going to make these repeating units that you can put together over and over and over again to get these big macromolecules. And macromolecules are the large organic molecules. And typically, you probably have heard organic in the consumer sense of uh, healthy food with no pesticides or preservatives. But organic in the science sense means something different. We're talking about uh, molecules that contain carbon and come from living or once living things. Now, I'm including your stems here. Stems are very important for this class. They will really help you learn these words if you can uh, break them down. So quiz yourself as we go through with these little purple uh, stems. Now, the way these macromolecules are going to be put together is through a process called dehydration synthesis. So dehydration synthesis can be broken down to D for removal of, Hydra for water and sin for together. So we're talking about putting together molecules by removing water. Okay, and so let's look at how that works. Here we have a diagram of dehydration synthesis. You can see glucose and fructose, and we're trying to put those together. So remember, water is going to be important here. Water has a chemical formula H2O. So we're trying to find two hydrogens and an oxygen between these two molecules that we can pull out and put together to be a water molecule, and that will open these up for bonding. So let's see how that works. We have an OH here. We have an OH here. If we take an H and another H and an O, then we have H2O. So that's our water molecule. We're going to pull that out, and that's going to open this side up. Okay, it's also going to open this oxygen up for another bond. And these two now can link together to give you a disaccharide, which we'll talk about in a little bit. But these are two linked monomers. Okay, so that is dehydration synthesis. Now, to put a molecule, um, to take a molecule apart, we're going to use a process called hydrolysis. And hydro again means water, lice means to cut. So this time we're going to use water to cut. Dehydration synthesis, we're pulling water out and putting molecules together. Hydrolysis, we are putting a water in and tearing molecules apart. So I know this isn't in English, but it's, it's close enough to where I hope that we can understand it. This is a lactose molecule. Lactose is in milk. You may have heard of lactose intolerance. We'll talk about that a little bit later. So lactose can be broken down by this enzyme lactase when it adds a water molecule. So let's see how that's going to work. This is going to break apart. The oxygen is going to go to one molecule. Let's say it went to this one. And the water is going to break apart. And we're going to attach one of the hydrogens here, and the, OH, and the OH that's left is going to be attached here. So we've broken the water and, and stuffed it in between these two molecules to break them apart. So you can try this with me. You can stick your hands out as your molecules, and we would sing this together in class if we were together. But dehydration synthesis puts the molecules together, and hydrolysis tears the molecules apart. You know, pause the video if you want and go through that a few times so that you can remember uh, how these molecules are put together and um, cut. 
Now, this is just a little chart, just going back over your different macromolecules, if there are four, and their monomers. And this is the one that we're going to be focusing on today. So carbohydrates have the monomer monosaccharides. And mono for one, saccharide means sugar. So this is one sugar. You can see lipids here. Lip means fat. And so fatty acids are going to be your monomer for that. Proteins use amino acids. Nucleic acids use nucleotides. Don't worry. You're going to hear that a lot over the next few lectures. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started talking about carbohydrates. Well, like I said, they do have a monomer one part that's going to that's going to make up these long molecules and the one part of a carbohydrate is called a monosaccharide we just talked about that mono for one saccharide for sugar now these monosaccharides are going to come together to give us these long carbohydrate molecules so the elements that we're going to be using are carbon hydrogen oxygen and let's just think about the word carbohydrate carbon and then hydro for water h2o that's going to give you the general formula for a carbohydrate. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but CH2O is the, is the formula for a general carbohydrate, the smallest one that you can get. So that means we're going to have a one to two to one ratio of these atoms. So let's break down what that means. For every carbon, you're going to have two hydrogens. For every two hydrogens, you're going to have one oxygen. And typically, these are going to come together to give you a hexagon shape. Hex means six, so this is a six-sided figure. So let's look here at this glucose molecule. And OS means sugar, so it's a very important sugar that we get from photosynthesis. And glucose has the chemical formula C6H12O6. So let's find those six carbons. They are the corners. One, two, three, four, five, and six. So those are your six or six carbons. And if we think about six carbons, then you should double that for your hydrogens. That would be 12. We can only see five, and we'll go over where the others are here in just a few minutes. But if you have six carbons, you should also have six oxygens. They are present in the same amount. So one, two, three, four, five, and six. All right. So where are these other hydrogens? Well, remember, how many bonds can carbon make? four right and if we look at each one of these carbons then you can see there's only three bonds going away from this carbon and only two bonds coming away from this carbon so that's going to fill in some of our missing hydrogens that just haven't been depicted here so we would have our five that we already counted and then six seven eight nine ten eleven and 12. So that would be where your other uh, hydrogens, hydrogens are going to be. So some other examples of monosaccharides are fructose and galactose. And hopefully you remember from the online lab, we tested fructose and we saw that it does test positive for monosaccharides because it is one. Okay. And we'll talk about why table sugar did not test positive for monosaccharides here in just a, a few minutes. Now, we can link these monosaccharides together using dehydration synthesis, right? We're taking that water molecule out to put these, these um, monosaccharides together. So di means two, saccharide means sugar. These are two sugars or two linked monosaccharides. The elements are the same. You still have your carbons, your hydrogens, and your oxygens, and that's all that's going to make up a carbohydrate. And think about the word carbohydrate right? So we have three examples of disaccharides. You have sucrose, which is your table sugar, maltose, which is beer sugar, and lactose, which we mentioned is milk sugar. And you can see how you would put these different monosaccharides together to get these disaccharides, but I put that there for your own benefit, just for you to know. I'm not going to quiz you on that or anything, um, but they are there to help you out if you're curious. So let's go ahead and think about table sugar and why it would not have tested for a monosaccharide. Keep in mind, monosaccharides typically are hexagons. I know this is not your traditional hexagon shape, but it does have six sides. Two, three, four, five, and six, okay? So if we're talking about these disaccharides, you can see that's two linked monosaccharides. So Benedict's will not test positive for a table sugar because it's a disaccharide. It's too big to be considered a simple sugar. All right, so why does the table sugar not test positive for starch? 
simple starch is a polysaccharide. And poly means many, and saccar means sugar. So these are many linked monosaccharides. And you can get these uh, unbranched chains, or you can get these branched chains. Um, so we have three primary polysaccharides that we're going to talk about. There are many other types of sugars that we're not mentioning in this, in this lecture, but Starch is the one we tested. It is a plant sugar storage molecule. You see it a lot in root crops like potatoes, which is why your mashed potatoes tested positive for starch. Cellulose or fiber makes up plant cell walls. So if we look here at this picture, you can see the space between each one of these uh, cells. Then that would be your cell walls and that is where your um, cellulose is going to be. Fiber, very important for your diet. You can't digest it, but it is important for pushing things through your digestive system. Glycogen is an animal storage of sugar. So once you eat sugars, it, it breaks down in your body, it goes to your liver, and your body puts that back together in this branch chain, which is going to be glycogen. Okay, so why did the table sugar not test positive for a polysaccharide? Table sugar is a disaccharide, so it is too simple, it is too small to bond with that Lugol's and test positively for that. I'm going to go over that again in just a few minutes. All right, carbohydrates think sugars, and so the monomer for the carbohydrates we talked about is a monosaccharide, one sugar. The main functions of a carbohydrate are short-term energy and structure. We saw that with the cell walls. Another example of a uh, sugar used for structure is chitin. Chitin is used to make insect exoskeletons, so if you've ever stepped on a bug and you hear it crunch, then you're, you're hearing that, that chitin, that sugar, break apart when you crunch the bug. So. Carbohydrates, main element CHO in that one to two to one ratio. They do dissolve in water because they are polar molecules. Polar just means that we have a charge on each end of that molecule, and um, that's going to allow that sugar to dissolve because it's also polar. And you saw that if you made Kool Aid or sweet tea in, in your intro activity for this lesson. The four most important carbohydrates that we're going to be talking about are, are glucose starch, cellulose, and glycogen. And glucose is the main monosaccharide that we're going to talk about. Um, starch we tested, um, remember that's going to be a plant sugar. Cellulose is a fiber, you can think of it as fiber, and then glycogen is our storage for animal sugar. So I've got you a picture here of some different kinds of carbohydrates. This is raw sugar and white sugar, and maybe we don't think about this one, but this is cinnamon, and cinnamon has lots of cellulose because it is bark from a tree and so you do have a lot of carbohydrates in cinnamon. This is a structure of cellulose and you can see this one makes it look like it's a branch or an unbranched chain but cellulose does have branches on it if you see the true structure. So we have some foods that are high in carbohydrates and we remember have different types of carbs. So your simple sugars or your monosaccharides, these are going to be your quick sources of energy, very easy for your body to break down. Um, and that comes from fruits, juices, honey, syrups, and, and a lot of actual hard candies have uh, simple sugars in them as well. Your complex carbohydrates, let's look at starches, and remember that these are plant storage sugars, so a lot of root crops have a lot of store, um, starch in them. Potatoes, breads, pastas, grains, fruits, beans, even onions, okay, have lots of um, starches. Cellulose is your fiber, right? And remember we talked about how this is making up cell walls. So a lot of your leafy vegetables, your green vegetables, have lots of plant cell walls that need that cellulose, and that's a good place to get your fiber. In fact, if you've ever eaten celery and you kind of break the celery apart, you can see it come apart in strings, and those strings are the cellulose and the fiber that you're looking at. We tested for carbohydrates already. We did this in our online lab. So you got to see that Benedict's solution tests for simple sugars. And the key to Benedict's was that you had to boil it. This is the only food test that we have that we're going to go over that you have to boil. And we also tested um, foods with Lugol's solution or iodine looking for starches. And so you don't have to boil Lugol's solution. In fact, you should not boil. It is actually harmful if it becomes vaporized. So these are a couple of pictures I took from just uh, things that I tested. And I want you to think really quickly about the problem that we might have been investigating 
when we got these results. So just kind of think about that, jot that down, pause if you need to. What problem would you think of for these results? And you can pause if you need. But hopefully you're thinking, well, we were investigating what types of foods would test positive for monosaccharides. In this one, we're testing what types of foods would test positive for starches. So we can look at these results and think back to what the problem could have possibly been when we did this lab. All right. Quick little summary slide for you of carbohydrates. Again, and I made a mistake here. I have to fix that before I give you this uh, PowerPoint. But elements and structure, you have CH2O, and this should be a 1 to 2, 2, 1 ratio. There should be a little colon right there. So that's not a 1 to 21. That's 1 to 2 to 1. Uh, one carbon for every two hydrogens for every one oxygen. And they generally give you that hexagon shape. The monomer is monosaccharides. Remember, one sugar. And their function Short-term energy and structure are the two main things that I want you to think of, but you can also uh, think about cellulose, the fiber, as aiding in digestion. And these are your four main examples. So quiz yourself real quick. See if you can remember what these four things, where do they come from and what do they do? So glucose, short-term energy, and that comes from photosynthesis. Starch is a, a way that plants store their sugar to break it down later to use. Cellulose makes up cell walls in plants, and glycogen is going to be how we as animals store our sugar. All right, quick little resource slide so that you can see where I got my pictures and um, most of this information I've just gathered and memorized over time, but uh, I do have some other information in there for you as well. I hope that you enjoyed this lecture. Once you have finished with this, I want you to think about sugars and how they can affect your life. So I've given you a web quest that I uh, created from the CDC website on diabetes. I'm sure you've heard of that before. It's actually one of the leading causes of amputation in adults in America. So I want you to investigate a little bit more about diabetes and hopefully that will help you make better life choices. All right, guys, I had a great time talking to you today. I'll see you next time.